also, um, I should say. She is uh, a JD and an MA. Uh, uh, Master of Arts is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership at our very own George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Professor Collier teaches courses in bioethics and serves as a special volunteer at the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health at the National Human Genome Research Institute, as well as at the NIH broadly. And on several occasions in the past, Professor Collier has taught genetics and law as an adjunct uh, at the GW Law School. And so um, she also, her research, I should say, Professor Collier's research focuses on issues at the intersection of bioethics, law, and emerging technologies, uh, which is exactly what she's here to speak with us today about. So without any further ado, Dr. Collier, uh, Professor Collier, take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I see some familiar faces. Um, I'm looking forward to talking with you today. So I guess I'll just go ahead and get started and, and share my slides. I'll start by saying that the views I am uh, sharing represent my own views and not anyone at uh, NIH or my colleagues at GW, although I will talk about some publications that um, I've co-authored with my colleagues at, um, at NIH. So, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, let's start with the agenda. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about my research related to uh, going beyond diversity and inclusion. We, many of us on the call are likely familiar with the, the discussion, the ongoing discussion about the need to recruit people who um, are a part of underrepresented minority groups to biomedical research in general. And in some ways, we are starting to see some progress in terms of recruitment. And so what I wanna discuss is what's next. And some of the work I've been doing related to um, interviewing and surveying individuals from underrepresented populations, um, evaluating some of the studies that have uh, taken place in Africa and the United States, and um, thinking about what trust means and trustworthiness means in research. And I only have a limited time, but I'll do my best. So I'll also discuss something I've spent a lot of time on, and most of the time I'll talk about this, the limits and potential harms of racial categories and also superpopulation categories that are used frequently in research. And um, I'll provide mostly a bioethics lens since I'm not a geneticist. I just work with geneticists and I enjoy uh, studying uh, and discussing genomics policy, but my background is in law and bioethics. I won't be spending a lot of time talking specifically about health disparities. Many people ask as we move forward in genomics research, what are the chances that genomics will help us to reduce health disparities. And I think, I think we all know, and given the environment that we're in right now, addressing health disparities and systematic differences in health effects, as well as in law enforcement and the criminal justice system, are at the top of many people's minds right now. And it's obviously a very important conversation um, that's actually outside of my purview and deserves its own its own presentation. Um, usually when I discuss genomics and others discuss genomics and health outcomes, that's what we're focusing on. Health outcomes say in the clinic, maybe access to genetic testing. Um, what are the results of a pharmacogenomic test? Is it useful? Is it inconclusive? How are different populations faring when we complete a genomic study? How useful are the results in different populations? So this article by West and colleagues really breaks down that there's a difference between health disparities and health outcomes that researchers don't always acknowledge when they talk about um, health disparities and health outcomes within the context of genomics and what genomics has to offer. We won't address health disparities with genomics alone, right? That will involve and require looking at social structures and social issues. So by way of background, I will start with a slide that some of you might have seen. Um, you may be familiar with this type of data. As of 2016, 80% of 
a certain type of genomic study called a genome-wide association study. These are popular studies for identifying genes that likely cause disease in individuals and in populations. 80% of those um, studies have been performed on people who identify usually as having European ancestry or majority European ancestry. And when it comes to people who come from other populations, African, the African continent, the African diaspora, Native American, Latinx, the, it, when we look at databases today and GWAS studies, GWAS for short, um, it's under 4%. And so this is the problem that funders and investigators have recently been trying to address. We've known for decades that diversity and inclusion uh, is low and um, that this is a challenge for researchers for, and that there are many causes. But in recent years, and this is what I wanna talk about today, in recent years and within the recent two years, we've seen an uptake in terms of inclusion and enrollment and, in, and community engagement strategies to ensure that people are enrolled in um, research studies. What is the promise of um, diversity and inclusion? This is a report from the National Academies of Sciences, which conducted a workshop in 2018. And um, this report entitled, Understanding Disparities in Access to Genomic Medicine, describes the promise of diverse and inclusive research. Um, the report explains that an important phase of the development of making genomic services accessible begins with building a foundation of evidence. And the evidence will hopefully demonstrate the positive effects of genomics and precision medicine on health outcomes. Um, the assertion is based on an optimistic view that precis precision medicine will one day benefit all people and benefit all communities. And the report references this, including hopefully community hospitals and underserved community clinics. Uh, scientists are legitimately concerned that underrepresentation will cause some populations to be left behind as data science, genomic science, precision medicine advances. And so we want to include enough people from all backgrounds so that we can stratify populations into subgroups and um, conduct research on those subgroups. My question, of course, is um, how do we define those subgroups? How do we define those populations? We are spending a lot of time, effort, and money in order to increase diversity and inclusion. How do we make sure that we're describing populations in a way that's going to be helpful for medicine and for translation? What are some of the challenges that we've heard? Um, some of you are familiar with a narrative that's repeated very often in publications about tr trust and mistrust. I work mostly with African-American communities, so I'm going to talk mostly about African-American communities. Um, but in the scientific and the medical literature, there's a repeated narrative about how difficult it is to recruit people of, um, with African ancestry to studies. But it's important to note that there are numerous studies that have shown that African-American populations may in fact be interested in the benefits of genetic information and the benefits of genetics and genetic testing for their communities. And that through community engagement, the All of Us initiative, um, the All of Us program has actually been very successful with um, recruiting people of uh, non-white backgrounds as of 2019, 51% of the participants in all of us were 50%, 51% were non-white, 80% meet the definition of being underrepresented because of age or gender and other factors of that nature. Um, so here's one study that stood, that stood out to me among those that I've reviewed, um, where the researchers engaged in focus groups with about 76 people of diverse backgrounds, African-American and non-African-American, and found that the majority of both were willing to participate in whole genome sequencing studies and that participants wanted to receive individual genetic test results. Um, but they found that African-Americans were less likely to express interest, but 
they thought that was because of discussions related to culture, social issues, expectations about the benefits. And so the authors recommended that when engaging African-American communities that the, rec that the um, engagement process be culturally tailored and that discussion about genetics consider cultural views and perspectives and how social, um, so how people engage socially or think about genetics as a cultural group might influence the discussions and understanding about genetics. But overall, they found that African-Americans are interested in genetics. I worked with a group at Howard University um, to examine the beliefs of African Americans living in the Washington DC area. And so we surveyed 272, we surveyed 300 people, 272 self-identified as being of the African diaspora. And we met with uh, participants at health fairs and at Howard University's clinic. Um, and in other health related areas in the DMV. And over 90% of our participants expressed a willingness to participate in genetic research. Now, of course, the survey talked about hypothetical research and there have been some studies to say that there are differences when the research is real versus when it's hypothetical. But we thought it was important to report our results that our respondents um, responded that genetic research is important that participants desired access to their own genetic information. Um, and that, of course, they were concerned about genetic discrimination and stigma, but still when it came to Alzheimer's, cancer's risk, cancer risk, even alcohol abuse, participants did overcome those, um, say that they would overcome those feelings of potential discrimination if they felt that the research would benefit their communities. And so again, another study, something I worked on with my colleagues in the area where we did find overwhelming interest in genetic research and just something to go against the myth um, or the, the larger narrative. Um, another topic I wanna touch on and just giving background here is um, beliefs about race, how we categorize people. Why do we categorize individuals based on race? Um, here are some common beliefs. Racial categories may reflect underlying population genetics. Any small benefit of relying on race may outweigh the potential harms caused by racism. Why abandon the practice of race? That would be unwise. We still have a lot to learn about genetics. And so some questions I wanna leave you with today are how are we defining populations? Evidence shows that individuals who could benefit from medical resources are sometimes directed away from those resources due to racial stereotyping and racial bias. So race sometimes, the use of race in the clinic and in research can sometimes be harmful. How can we ensure that when we are asking questions based on race, how can we ensure that those questions um, and that use of race is justified? Even if we do recruit enough minorities to research, is the use of the data just and fair? Will we use the data? This article reported that even when data from minority groups are available, many researchers discard the data. Now, there are many reasons. The article talks about the potential confounding of results when um, the research cohort is too diverse. Um, they also discuss sample size. If the researchers only focus on a small subpopulation, there's the potential that there won't be enough statistical power for the results to be meaningful. And the authors push back against that and um, really argue in favor of, again, building up a diverse data set and analyzing the data that we have that um, is representative of underrepresented minorities, because that's the only way we're going to be move forward and for the research to be just and fair for those who we are recruiting in, in such high numbers now to participate in research. Um, in the empirical study that these investigators um, conducted, 45 out of 58 of the studies that they reviewed ignored data about um, minority populations, they did not publish that data or study or analyze the data. Many of you may be familiar with this figure um, this was one of the um, articles that sounded the alarm on 
uh, the fact that there had not been much change between 2009 and 2016 for people from African-American, Asian, Latin, and uh, Native background. Um, but what stood out to me um, was the differences in terms of how populations were described in the data that they reviewed. So they claimed, they argued that they found considerable heterogeneity in the descriptions of different populations. For example, there were 26 terms that included black cases where cohorts were simply described as black or sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, sub-Saharan African. And um, these very vague and broad terms were used to describe people with African ancestry. And they found that the most geographically specific and informative descriptions were those used for people who self-identify as white and have um, European origin or European ancestry. Now, of course, when it comes to African-American communities, individuals often don't know their specific ancestry or, or lineage or ethnicity. So it's a particular challenge to be able to provide details about a person's ancestry or ethnicity. But um, this is the kind of challenge that we are facing now as our research data sets become more diverse. We need better ways to describe populations that are included in the data sets. And we want to promote equity too, in terms of how we are describing the different groups as well to the best of, of our ability. And this is of interest to um, NIH currently, and I'll say more about that. Um, my colleagues at NIH, Amy Bentley and Charles Rotimi, uh, they are both geneticists, and uh, we've worked together on a couple of publications where we examined why diversity and inclusion has been a challenge for so long around the globe and why progress has been so slow. And recently we decided to look at the promise of inclusion and take a look at studies that show some promise on the continent of Africa and here in the United States. One of the first things we did, even though the title says, evaluating the promise of inclusion of African ancestry populations, one of the first things we wanted to do was to describe what we meant by African ancestry and to say that this is a super category and super categories usually apply or reflect a continent or a region. And it's a way for geneticists to identify the geographical and ancestral background of their participants. Um, but it's super categories are broad. So African ancestry encompasses all of Africa, right? And people who are of, have African ancestry and are sometimes called African ancestry individuals or European ancestry individuals, you've probably heard that. African ancestry individuals could have background from many different places in Africa as well as other places as well. But we uh, acknowledge that there is some importance related to the fact that this person is not of the European ancestry population that, we're typic that we typically study or that we have a lot of data on. And we want to signal that this is a different ancestral group. And so we use that term African ancestry person or population. And what we wanted people to know was that this is an imperfect term. This is what we mean by it here in this article, but that a person, if we looked at an individual's genome, that we could find ancestry from different places depending on where we're looking on the genome. And we wanted to make that clear to our readers. There's our definition. This article was written by my colleague, Dr. Perry Payne, this is the opposite. This is what we want to avoid. Using a super category to explain diversity on say a pharmacogenomic uh, label or a drug label. And uh, so in this article, ancestry-based pharmacogenomics, adverse reactions and carbamazepine, is the FDA warning correct? Dr. Payne, took a look at all of the research that led to this drug label. And he argued that the FDA alert overstated the evidence 
on ethnic populations at risk for an adverse reaction to the drug. So at the time of his investigation, only two out of 37 Asian countries, countries were included in the studies that he reviewed and that were used to support the FDA label. And the label said that people with ancestry across broad areas of Asia, including South Asian Indians, are more likely to have the HLA variant and should be screened for the allele. And he noted that this alert was based on data that represented far less than half of the global Asian population. And this is the kind of, uh, this is the, an example of the type of labeling that we like to see improved upon when we are, as we move forward with our research. I wrote about this in an article about racial categories and precision medicine research. And you may re remember Barack Obama saying in 2016 that the promise of precision medicine is delivering the right treatments at the right time, every time to the right person. And keeping in mind what uh, Dr. Payne has described, what uh, Pope Joy and Fullerton described in their article about genomics failing on diversity, I focused on um, the laws, the, the FDA requirements and the NIH policies and explained that currently NIH requires NIH funded researchers, as all of you know, to use the OMB census categories to demonstrate that they are being, the researchers are being inclusive. And the FDA recommends the use of the OMB census categories when summarizing demographic safety and efficacy data. Um, but in practice, and um, many researchers have talked about this in a number of um, publications and books over a long period of time, uh, re researchers generally report their results as well based on the OMB census categories, even when they um, don't have significant uh, numbers in those groups and often without justifying why they're dividing the data based on race. And they do this because they wanna satisfy these categories. And so I've argued this in this paper and others have argued the same. Um, although the NIH and FDA guidelines have a goal of inclusion and addressing underrepresented minorities in research, um, un uh, addressing underrepresentation, that these policies are not going far enough, that they haven't been successful in terms of um, enhancing diversity and inclusion research. Um, and instead, what often happens is that biological categories are often described in terms of the OMB census categories. And this is a far cry from what President uh, Obama had in mind when he talked about um, precision medicine. Um, the use of these OMB categories in research reflects a long held practice and belief of, of sorting people into races and believing, as I stated earlier, one of the beliefs that um, race is correlated with continental ancestry. And um, geneticists say this all the time. And yes, uh, a person who identifies as African has some ancestry on the continent of Africa, but how can we go beyond that so that our results can be even more meaningful when we are treating the individual patient. Um, so at the top in figure A, we have what people think about race, that people are just clustered and that um, genetics is biological and that there's this sharp difference and separation between racial groups um, biologically. And what we know is actually true is that groups do cluster, um, but there is so much more diversity within regions and within racial groups than across racial groups. And, and that is where genetics can help us move forward and get closer to precision medicine, understanding genetic variation and going beyond super ancestry categories or broad racial categories. Here's another image from the same article where the investigators looked at a case study um, and they compared the famous scientists, Watson, Venter, and Kim, 
And so they, in this helpful image, they are attempting to show how much ambiguity there is between races and that there can be so much variation within racial groups. They argue that two people of European descent may be more genetically similar to an Asian person than they are to each other. And so the image represents a case study of the genetic variation between these scientists on the left, the images depict uh, genetic variation between the three. The colored bars represent genes and different colors represent different versions of the genes. The dark brown allele is shared by every single person in the image. Watson and Venter share another allele that's represented by a, a bright blue color, but both share two alleles with Kim. Watson shares a red and orange allele with Kim. Venter shares green and uh, magenta. So the image is attempting to, sh to show that there's more similarity here, or it does show, between Kim and Watson and Kim and Ventor than there is between Watson and Ventor. This is an image I, I really like when talking about diversity and thinking about how um, genetic variation changes as we move across the globe. Um, this is a mosaic that denotes global population diversity. Uh, the individual people in the pedigree chart represent the complex diversity of recent ancestors. Um, what I hope we can move closer to as we engage in precision medicine, genomics, and data science research is understanding admixture, getting a better sense of how admix admixture impacts health outcomes. The more we focus on uh, broad racial categories, we run the risk of focusing uh, on blanket racial categories. And we also run the risk of um, missing important questions and variables that have nothing to do with race. But there are also, um, some, there's also more that we can learn about how a person's diverse ancestry impacts their health outcomes. Um, in this article um, by Dr. Rotini, my colleague, he takes a very close look at um, different populations on the African continent, as well as populations on the American continent. Um, when Abacavir was first approved as a drug, researchers noticed that people of European ancestry were more likely to have adverse reactions to the drug. And so the FDA recommended early on that anyone who identified as having European ancestry or being white um, obtain a genetic test before being prescribed abacavir because of the potential adverse reactions. That has changed today. Today, um, most people have a genetic test before um, receiving a prescription for abacavir. Um, researchers went back and looked at the data after the discovery about European ancestry populations and found that the variants um, were quite different even within co continents. So you could see zero prevalence in the Yoruba of Nigeria, 3.3 .3 on the other side of um, the continent in Kenya and East Africa, um, but 13.6 among the Maasai neighbors to those uh, of the Luya. And, um, you know, I've talked about this slide many times. Of course, people might identify as Luya and still have Maasai ancestry, but these uh, figures show us uh, the, the prevalence or percentage of variation um, that we might see when looking at a particular ethnic group. And what the authors concluded was that labels such as Black or African obscure biomedically relevant variation. It turns out that the Gujar Gujarati Indians in Southwest America have the highest prevalence of the var HLA variation that can cause a person to have an adverse and possibly fatal reaction to abacavir. Now that was Africa. What about in the United States where we typically use terms like black and African-American to describe all black patients? Many um, medical guidelines use the terms black, African-American, or they'll say a minority patient, non-European patient. And um, these authors um, looked at data from 
various cohorts across the United States and discovered that um, the genetic variations told the history of the people who live here. Um, you would see genetic variation historically, big populations would become more admixed around the same times that uh, desegregation laws started to be passed. Um, importantly, they note that African Americans have been underrepresented in genetic studies and that we know very little about nationwide patterns of genomic diversity within African American populations. Through this work, this, these figures show African American patients and the diversity and ancestry that these patients have, depending on the cohort. Um, but you can see that a person who's living in Northwest America will have less African ancestry, is more likely to have less African ancestry and more European ancestry, according to their data, than someone living in Southeast America. And then in figure D is one patient who has ancestry from diverse populations. The patient self-identified as African-American, but the investigators inferred ancestry through genetic ancestry testing. This year, more than half of children born are expected to be a part of a minority race or minority ethnic group. Multiple studies have shown an increase, as I was just saying, in an ancestral variation since the mid 1960s here, but we know that populations have been uh, mixing and integrating across the globe for as long as time. Um, the article below points to or describes health outcomes that have changed based on um, whether or not a person has ancestry from diverse backgrounds from Europe and Africa, for instance. And in my work, I've come across a number of articles like that one, but they're, they're limited, that describe how genetic admixture can have a positive or negative effect on health outcomes. And so it's another example of what we can do besides or how we can go beyond race looking at ancestry, looking at genetics, and also taking into account diverse ancestry to help us better understand health outcomes. Unfortunately, while I think that um, in my interactions, my colleagues, I seem to sometimes be in an echo chamber where we all agree that diversity and inclusion is important and that race is an insufficient category for describing populations and that we would like to use genetics and also take into account social and economic status, zip code, environment, diet, behavior, perceived race, and all of these other factors. And that sometimes questions about race will be relevant because they'll help us understand the impact of racism. Other times we might find that educational attainment has a higher impact on someone's health outcome than anything else, especially in racial categories. But researchers, especially those in the books that I've listed here, who've written the books that I've listed here, have been documenting the steady and consistent and even increasing use of racial categories among scientists. And they blame it on a number of factors. They, they discuss the NIH and FDA categories. They discuss um, uh, drug patents and incentives to bring a drug back to market, for example, by uh, taking a look at racial differences. That was uh, the case of Vital, which was approved by the FDA as uh, the only race-based drug and in indication in 2005. Um, and others just don't believe that, that we all are similar um, and are looking sometimes for racial differences as, as, as explained in the book Superior in 2019. Um, Michael Udell, Dorothy Roberts, Sarah Tishkoff, Rob DeSalle, these are individuals of diverse um, disciplines, um, geneticists, lawyers, for example. And so they wrote a letter in 2020, about 70 people, um, academics have already signed the letter and they've been circulating it and obtaining more signatures. Uh, I, have not, I haven't seen a published number of how many people have, people have signed it, but the um, the writers are 
calling on NIH to, to do something different, to confront the fact that race is still persistently used by investigators and um, that it is reifying this notion that race has biological meaning, even as the evidence and some of the evidence I've showed you is just is um, minimal compared to what already exists, that race is insufficient. So it's something we're still grappling with. We don't have solutions on uh, what should replace race just yet. In 2017, NIH held a workshop examining the use of race and ethnicity in genomics and biomedical research and talked about the challenges and debated the issues. Um, the challenge of how to measure race is exacerbated by the growing numbers of mixed or multiracial individuals. But at the same time, one of the conclusions of the workshop was that we should still hold on to racial categories so that we can assess differences that might be caused by society. Um, but at the same time, improve the collection of data related to ancestry and genetics. Um, and all of us the All of Us Initiative is doing the same thing, collecting racial data, ethnicity data. It's not doing it in the same format as OMB and the categories. There are more categories that you can select um, than the OMB categories, um, but it's collecting all racial data in addition to biometric data and health record information and Fitbit data and genetic uh, data. Um, but the ongoing challenge that this workshop hopes to address and that researchers are grappling with this very day is explaining why race is being used, defining the cohort, defining the ancestry of the cohort, defining the race of the individuals of the cohort. Um, and in this article here by Ali Khan and colleagues in 2011, she found that no article used race, ethnicity, or ancestry in a well-defined way or discussed the meanings of these concepts um, in the context of the study. And they concluded that there remains a clear imperative for highlighting the importance of consistent and comprehensive reporting on human populations. Others have found the same. This article by Bonham and colleagues was published in 2018, and they found similarly that um, researchers were inconsistently discussing race, ethnicity, and ancestry data, and also um, that there were times when variables other than race um, were relevant. The same practice um, is reflected in how research, researchers report differences in medical journals. And uh, Dr. Richard Cooper and colleagues are uh, discussing in this 2018 article the, the challenges and the problems with racializing data and publishing it in medical journals. We see the same thing with pharmacogenomics. And uh, Sarah Nelson and colleagues found that even the genetic investigators and professionals have diverse views and understandings about race, ancestry, ancestry, and genetics. We're just not on the same page. And um, uh, NIH is in the process of uh, moving forward. I know there's a, um, a um, uh, announcement now requesting, um, requesting that researchers submit proposals for how we can better talk about racial and ethnic identity. Um, and uh, how we can better categorize populations. This is a process that we're still working on. I am hopeful though, because uh, that uh, call exists and because of the publications that have continued to come out and also because of the work that we're doing globally. Um, H3 Africa um, was funded, I think for the first time in 2011 and has already received a, a, a commitment of uh, $150 million over 10 years to support research in Africa. And I think we can learn a lot from H3 Africa uh, from what they are doing there. Um, H3 Africa has already funded um, many different types of studies, consortia, trainees, and um, workshops. Um, there are a number of conferences that happen every single year. And um, the goal is not just to increase diversity and inclusion in research, but a major 
aspect of this program is to build capacity so that African researchers conduct, can conduct research and so that um, they can build their own research uh, portfolios. Some of the, there's a policy that um, allows researchers a 23 month embargo. So no other, even if they share their data globally, no other researcher should publish that data or publish any information related to that data until after um, the researchers in Africa have had a chance to publish first and to, to focus on priorities for, uh, for Africa and for their, for their regions and for their countries. So um, it's simultaneously um, producing research on the African continent that's locally relevant while also helping to build the capacity of researchers there so that they can continue to do that research in the future. Um, uh, uh, one quote in the article says, the proof of its success will not be in the numbers of papers published, but rather in the number of African investigators able to charge ahead after the grant ends in 2022. Uh, recently, NIH also announced a plan to provide $58 million over five years for a new initiative on harnessing data science for health discovery and innovation in Africa. And uh, this program will build on H3 Africa and um, hopefully catalyze, uh, as the article says, catalyze innovation and health discoveries on the African continent. So um, this kind of uh, investment has already opened the door to studies that can help us identify mutations that um, are not as prevalent or not prevalent at all in European ancestry populations. And the goal is, is not just to help us understand um, genomics for African populations, but this is um, scientifically um, imperative for understanding global human genomic diversity. And um, H3 Africa is going beyond um, what you might've heard of the, the helicopter research model where researchers come in and leave and take the data and the DNA samples to benefit a different population, but rather helping uh, African participants to engage in and be a part of global genomic discovery. And um, in our article, we talked about a number of studies related to kidney disease and heart disease. We talked about uh, polygenic risk scores and um, how um, research on polygenic risk scores in European ancestry populations uh, do, does not work well. Those scores don't travel over to other populations. And so we really need to have the research done in diverse populations to understand um, polygenic risk scores and other genetic variations and how um, a certain pattern of a genetic variation might impact what we are seeing uh, in a genetic test result. Um, so these authors who we've cited in this particular study, they themselves talk about how important it is to conduct studies in Africa um, because uh, Africa is the cradle of humanity, has the greatest genetic diversity um, on the globe, that understanding selection across the continent will provide insight into possible migrations, infectious exposures, and admixture. Um, another study um, explained how its strength was that it has broad geographical coverage. Um, the study draws from West, East, and Southern Africa. Contrast this with what Hope, Joy, and Fullerton found that categories such as Black, were often used or sub-Saharan Africa were also often used. These particular studies are pinpointing the regions. Um, the third study in the upper right-hand corner um, actually talked about the centers and the ethnic groups where people ca came from. So really going beyond the soup category, going beyond even regional categories to really do a better job of explaining the populations that are included in the research when we are talking about genomic variation. Uh, Professor Collier, we had a yes. question. Uh, sure. um, that is from uh, Professor Isam. I really enjoyed your presentation. If you had the power to change clinical trials guidelines, what would you recommend to investigators in terms of describing their study results and generalizability to different populations? In other words, should genetic testing be part of medical history for all studies? 
or should be uh, only investigative differences in intervention around traditional concepts of race are found? Well, one of the challenges that my colleagues and I talked about in the article, diversity and inclusion, uh, genomics research, why the uneven progress is a desire to compare every new population that we study against European ancestry populations. And we've had for so long GWAS studies on European populations that these studies are quite large. These data sets are um, immense. And um, we just can't compete when it comes to a small study of diabetes in a small group in Burkina Faso, for example, or a, a region of Africa um, in terms of the power and the numbers. And so it will take time to build those data sets, but we should not ask researchers to, who are um, spending time focusing on a, a underrepresented minority population, we shouldn't expect them to have the same numbers as those who've been doing GWAS and building on GWAS data sets on European ancestry populations. That's just one uh, challenge that we should address. Um, in terms of clinical trials, the article I mentioned about that talked about ignoring the data suggests that that data be studied, that we um, are straightforward about the population, who the people are, where they're from geographically, and what we're seeing in that population. And if you can produce those types of results versus the kinds of results that Ali Khan and her colleagues found where there was no defining of the populations that they used in most of the publications that they reviewed, um, we can build on that data and we can get to a place where our data um, begins to have the power and the statistical significance so we can talk about what's going on in these diverse populations. Perfect. Um, another um, uh, challenge, of course, I wanna bring this to the health context um, is that physicians end up, um, there's a lot of confusion among physicians and disagreement about how to talk about race and the role of race in medical care. To gain some better insight into how cardiologists think about race and medicine, my colleagues and I interviewed 81 cardiologists at um, the American College of Cardiology meeting um, a few years ago. And we asked them specifically about the drug Vital, whether they prescribe Vital or its generics, um, isosorbide, dinitrate, and hydralazine, um, and who they prescribe the drug too, and we asked them what they think about race-based medicine and what they think about a drug being approved for um, only a particular racial group. And um, um, many of the participants responded that they believe that race-based drug label labels actually might help doctors prescribe effective medications to patients sooner. Uh, but more than half of the participants also expressed concern about the use of race. Um, they thought that um, there could be some harms, that people who uh, should receive a medication or might qualify for a medication might be denied that medication or that they might not be directed to services because of um, their uh, racial background. Um, um, and that there's insufficient understanding about gene drug environment interactions. And some of them argue that um, race is a sim simplistic application and fill in for um, more complex interactions. Uh, few participants expressed approval of using uh, race-based drug prescribing without also recognizing that there are um, potential harms related to using race in medicine. Um, and so uh, this article, other articles in the literature related to Bidol, there is a real robust debate about whether race is useful. Um, others have written about how we, could, we can possibly enrich clinical trials by focusing on subpopulations and that we should, some argue that we should not make race the defining challenge or the defining issue about vital when it could possibly help 
in, in the clinical trial, it helped over 40% of the pop of the um, participants who were all African American. Um, others alternatively argue that patients and not physicians should define a person's race, that research participants should have a role in defining and talking about their own ancestry, that it's difficult to assess a patient's race, especially just by looking at them, that race is a crude um, variable for other, uh, that substitute, that's a substitute for other factors that we conflate the importance of race with the importance of other considerations like zip code and access to care and exposure to racism, and um, that there are monetary incentives for uh, the research pipeline, and that's why people use race. Um, so as my final, I believe this is my final slide, this conversation about the impact in the clinic um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently, where the authors discussed a number of clinical algorithms that are used that uh, change based on the person's race and how some institutions are changing their practices in the clinic and uh, thinking of um, other factors that impact health and trying to go beyond the race-based categories. Um, another article I have here has to do with um, the clinical impact of a lack of diversity and inclusion. So on one hand, when we focus on the use of race, we could create harm in uh, the clinic uh, by the way, by treating patients based on racial categories. And on the other, if there's a lack of diversity and inclusion in uh, research, then we're in a situation where we can only help certain patients and we don't have any genetic information for the others. And um, uh, Latrice Landry and her colleagues explained how a barrier to precision medicine could be that um, only patients with European ancestry would be offered genetic testing and others wouldn't. Um, uh, the New York Times article reflects is about a New England Journal of Medicine study where um, patients who have Black um, African ancestry were um, misdiagnosed for their risk um, uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what's happening in the research space um, is impacting the clinical realm and will continue to impact the clinical realm. Um, and part of the solution will be more diverse and inclusive clinical uh, and biomedical research, in this case, genetic research, but also thinking more about the variables that we're using to conduct this research. So looking towards the future, um, what will fair and inclusive research look like? Um, we'll, we'll better define our, our groups and our cohorts, and we'll find new ways to capture diversity and also look past race and other factors that lead to diversity and outcomes. Um, what kinds of research questions will investigators and funders prioritize? That I have that question there because NIH found and other studies have found that um, questions about social determinants and social factors and all the multiple complex factors that play a role in health outcomes are often not prioritized by funders in research. And so the questions almost always end up being genetic. And to really uh, break through, we'll have to have more funding, uh, funding of diverse researchers. Maybe we could learn something from H3 Africa in terms of um, uh, investing in training and capacity building within diverse communities, um, and also uh, investing in questions, research questions that are not just about race. And that's all I have. Happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Professor Collier. Uh, any we're at one, but uh, there's time for a question from anyone who's uh, has a burning question or thought. Okay, I'm going to ask one. I'll take the okay. there's not um, the funders. That's I, that. Um, it, it seems like, and of course, having doing dry based research, non-genetic dry lab research. I obviously have a stake in the game. It seems as we know that the NIH does not necessarily prioritize 
the Sisperides research, either intentionally or non unintentionally, the evidence suggests it's less likely to be funded. Whether or not that, how much of that is based on the study section and biases within it, and how much of that is based on, uh, is um, based on what the RFAs are that are released are, and how much of it is based on like what the NIH is its priorities. That being said, it seems that you did an outstanding job of laying out that that's a piece here that's missing. Right? How seemingly? How, how can we um, push? I know it was tight with COVID. Everyone, no one has any money. How can we push? Uh, do you think the relevance of this, the importance of this, to to the funders? Any thoughts? I mean, this is magic wandy, I know, but <laughs> well, there is a great deal of um, community engagement happening with programs such as the All of Us Initiative. Mm -hmm. And I think empirical research can play a role here in terms of asking people what's important to them in terms of the questions that are being asked. And also what makes individuals of, from under, underrepresented minority backgrounds want to participate in genetic and biomedical research. And um, if, if we can engage in more empirical research to understand what the factors are that make people want to participate, I think that would help too. Because from my own research with um, participants in the DMV area of African-American background, um, they were interested in helping their communities mm -hmm. and future generations. And um, through education, um, understand that genetics alone is not going to solve the problems that they are seeing every day in their communities. And mm -hmm. if um, there are engagement strategies and um, research consortia that are looking at building trust and also building, helping us understand what makes an institution trustworthy and mm -hmm. trustworthy enough for people to want to engage in research. Um, these are scientifically based studies that can help us um, push discussion about funding uh, questions that really do address the surrounding issues that cause health disparities and not just genetics alone. And mm -hmm. you know, we're, I think we're getting closer to that with um, data science in terms of taking into account uh, factors besides just biology. Very helpful. Agree. Any other final questions before? Uh, we close today. Uh, I've already gotten texts that this was outstanding and others who've missed it will be watching the recording. So this yeah, will be- I just wanted to say before you oh, go, go ahead, amazing go ahead. presentation. Thank you, it was really informative, thank you. Oh, wonderful, thank you so much. I and he's a visitor from much. another center. That's how, that's, how, that's how wide your cast was. Fantastic. <laughs> I never know- Science operations. Thank you so much for your comment. I never really know how much um, attendees know about genetics or um, think about genetic variation. So it's always uh, difficult to navigate that, but I'm, I'm really glad to hear that it was uh, helpful. Thank you for the comment. You're very welcome. Great. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Collier. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll close it out. Everyone, happy Tuesday. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.